once around the park, James, and don't spare the horses. <laughs> All right, so we are at the end. I'm just trying to figure this all out. We're at the end of the constituency week that came right after the first four days after the Ford government prorogued the legislature at Queen's Park. And, well, I, you know, I, I guess it's probably overstating it to suggest that there's a few three-coil steamers kind of sitting out there for them this week just because of the way the whole thing has unfolded around reopening and nobody there to answer any questions so welcome in this is on the ledge it's the ontario politics podcast joined as usual by keith leslie and john wright and we're happy to have sabrina nanji from the queen's park observer joining us this week how are you i'm good feeling good after a thanksgiving long weekend and some turkey and ready to jump back into it after a consent break well, you know, that's funny. You and I were talking about this on the radio on the weekend and, and the uh, the idea that, you know, they had prorogued the legislature during the federal campaign uh, for whatever reason, quote unquote, and it came back for four days. They don't sit typically on Fridays. They drop this stink bomb late Friday afternoon about what can open, what can't open. There's nobody around to answer any questions on it because they just issued a statement. So it has just been this endless chorus, Sabrina, over the last four or five days of how come them and not us? Why the us and not them? Uh, Vis-a-vis who can open to capacity? Today, as we record this, we're getting ready to hear from the Premier, but we're still not going to get any guidance on when, for example, restaurants, bars, and gyms, for example, are going to be able to open and start doing business at full capacity. I don't, I don't understand how this can possibly turn into a, a good news story for the Ford government. Yeah, and it, it's funny because I think it could have been a good news story. All this um, news about reopening, you know, going back to 100% capacity at theaters and arenas, uh, you know, obviously restaurants weren't happy about being left out of that. But that should have been a, a good news story that, you know, uh, we're, we're doing so well with our vaccination rates. Uh, we can start opening up a little bit more, get a little back to normal, uh, a little more back to normal. Uh, but like you said, they dropped this on the, the Friday before Thanksgiving. It was a a news dump and the restaurants were up in arms over it. Uh, they still are. And now there's word that next week we'll be hearing more details on what comes after step three. So, you know, when restaurants and bars will be able to lift their capacity limits. Um, I'm hearing that that probably won't happen for another two weeks. Um, which seems to align with what the top doctor was saying this week, Dr. Moore saying that, you know, um, he wants to see the data from Thanksgiving, but again, it's just kind of been this hodgepodge mixed bag release of, of policies with, um, with no real explanation or data, you know, concrete information to back it up. A lot of people asking questions, um, just a really sloppy rollout all around. So, John, one of the things that I heard come up this week, and and, the question was, why would you have the stadiums open and not the restaurants? And the answer has been focusing on the restaurants, for example, saying, well, there's a more likelihood of spread there because blah, 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 blah. And they kind of fall back on that. But they don't show any hard numbers. The other side of this is I heard Colin DeMello at CTV reporting on this this week when asked about that. Well, how much of a problem has it been in the stadiums and the sports venues? Well, they don't track that. They don't take those that those numbers at all. So you're the numbers guy. How can you possibly come up with something that's conclusive uh, w- without tracking everything that you're doing and telling me that it's you know sound science? Well, I think nobody's been tracking accurately the spread of where this stuff is, except community based spread. Because when you test it, you know where people live. So I have yet to see, and maybe I'm sheltered from the world, but I've yet to see tracking from restaurants and gyms that say that they are the chief culprits. If anything, I've known restaurants to be the most um, judicious in terms of taking down everybody's name and phone number and all of those other things. So I, I, I don't, I don't understand the, uh, the lack of data on that alone. Maybe it's because that's where they had to go to find out where the spread was, ha- where, where people who got it, were actually identified and therefore they were tracking it back to a false place, right? Like if you walk up and you've already got 
you, you know, you get COVID two weeks uh, within a two week span, but you've gone to a restaurant in between, you know, some people might point and say, well, it's the restaurant where you got it as opposed to somewhere else. Ridiculous. I think the, the real problem with the Ford government is A, they dumped it, but B, they also didn't have yet the QR code ready to go. I think what they're doing is tying um, that situation to the QR code saying, look, you know, we're we're launching it. And so that's what the premier is going to do. My wife was able to download hers this morning before the site crashed. I'm sure that that will be even part of the narrative saying, look, we got to make sure it's all worked out and everything is fine. But I suspect that they will delay the implementation of this, not just to see about Thanksgiving, but also to see whether or not this this whole QR code thing works. Now, last night I was able to download another one, which in fact reads those. And so the excuse will be, we don't have to have people self-policing at the doorway with a bunch of paper. They just walk up and staff can zap it and they get in. And this will make it easier for everybody all around. But again, it, it doesn't address the fundamental. And that is, what is different between having a group of vaccinated people sitting side by side in a restaurant versus a group of vaccinated people sitting side by side in a large arena or at a concert. That's the incongruity of whole, this whole thing. And I don't know how the government answers that. Yeah. Keith, I watched the, uh, the home opener for the Leafs and uh, last night it was the Leafs and the senators and yeah, there were people in the stands wearing masks, but there were a lot of people sitting cheek by jowl, not wearing masks. So, you know, to John's point, that's the, there's the inconsistency, but on the QR code question this morning, you know, there was a big reveal that, okay, oh my, it's already available. I, I got to give them credit for, as John points out, giving us sort of this two week runway, at least to say, make sure it works, make sure everybody's got it on their phones before it's activated. But let's be clear. It's not activated right now. It's not something that you're going to use when you go to the restaurant this afternoon for lunch. Um, and so let's no. be really understanding the, the, of the process here. They may want to see it on your phone. They may want to see the picture of your, your, uh, Vax pass with the proof of vaccination with the QR code, but they don't have a reader for that QR code. That's right. So they're just looking at basically your printout. Uh, and that's going to go on for several weeks yet. So that's what they're going to communicate today. And I guess it makes sense, but let's not have a false sense of security about the QR codes. They're just not ready yet. They're not activated. Well, we can download them. The other end of it is not at all set up for this yet. What really baffles me again is the communications on this, that they would dump it on, you know, five o'clock Friday and a long weekend. That's really a traditional dump day for the bad, bad news. You, you put this out there with no justification, and here it is a week later, and Restaurants Canada and the bars and the other groups, the Chamber of Commerce, are wondering, what on earth is the justification? For, where is it? What's the bag? How can you possibly justify capacity limits of 50% in restaurants and bars and gyms, and then turn around and say arenas and concert halls can be filled? It's just it's ridiculous. There's no possible communications plan for it. Or if there was, we should have heard it in the past seven days. The fact that they left this out there. And then on Tuesday, uh, the Restaurants Canada, the government set up a meeting with Restaurants Canada to discuss this. They expected Minister Lisa McLeod to be there. She wasn't. She was off touring a hospital in Ottawa. And so that just made the Restaurants Association even more livid at a situation that they still don't understand. And all they got in that Tuesday meeting where they were snubbed by the minister who didn't show up was the government's working on a plan. Seriously, at this point in the game, they got no justification for this. We've heard no justification for this. And as a communications plan, there isn't one. It's just, it's a complete and utter failure. And that shocks me more than anything. Well, uh, Sabrina, I'm going to blame you because uh, I think I read your newsletter that morning and you had said, I I understand that they're going to this soon come. Something's going to happen quickly. The minister's working on a meeting this morning. So clearly you misunderstood and misled everybody involved here because, <laughs> you know, you, you, you put it out there that this was, uh, this was going to happen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, I think we, we had the jump on that, that McLeod was supposed, Lisa McLeod uh, the tourism minister was supposed to be at that meeting, but I guess there was a change in plan, a change in schedule. Although I, I did hear that it was her her uh, staff that that set up the meeting and, and scheduled it in the first place. So I guess there was a little bit of a, a mix up there. But uh, you know, th they had some senior officials there. It, it was a very heated meeting, as, as Keith said. Um, and I, I think you know, there's a lot of there's there was a lot of talk about how this could be damaging to the the PCs in particular, who are, you know, the friend of small business, especially this premier, he's championed him, himself as being all about small business um, and restaurants, bars, gyms, salons, they're really upset with, with 
for the Ford government right now over this policy. Um, and there were threats made on this call saying that, you know, Lisa's in trouble, that, you know, there are uh, 450,000 people in this industry and, and we're not going to forget this. And there's an election coming up, uh, you know, in, in less than eight months. So I think that there's a lot of anger about this. Um, it's it's I, I'm really, you know, anticipating what the premier is going to say. I think there's going to have to be a lot of damage control. But at the same time, I think I think that they're going to play it as we're playing it safe. You know, we're we're making um, evidence based decision making. You know, we're waiting on the data. We you know, we the public and reporters have not seen that data. But, you know, I, I think that that's how the, the Ford government's going to play it. Uh, we were kind of seeing that that language and, you know, comparing, uh, you know, maybe not as blatantly and outright, but comparing Ontario to Alberta and and Jason Kenney. The, the rumors are that when Ontario comes out of step three, we'll hear more details about that next week, but that the indoor masking rules, for instance, will stay in place. Um, and, and some of that seems to be uh, you know, unlike other provinces, we, we've learned our lessons. That's kind of the, the PC line behind the scenes right now. So I think um, that, that, that there's a way the PCs can spin this and they're going to spin it like they're, they're playing it, it cautiously, I think. Yeah, but if this had been the first time through the lineup, John, I would understand that, you know, okay, we're going to have to adjust our pitching strategy here a little bit. But it's not. We have been talking about the restaurant, that particular sector, for the last six months being the one that's the outlier, the outside looking in and all of this stuff that the government is doing. I had a laugh. I was telling the Keith before we came on the air. I read a piece this morning, and one of the quotes from an insider says, well, you know, there are times when we've moved too quickly. You know, not really. I mean, I get it. About a year ago when we kind of got into it around February and and heading into to, to stage three. But eternally, this government has been dragging its heels on this particular sector. I, I don't quite understand it. No, and again, I go back to what I said at the outset. I have yet to see the empirical data that says these are the major culprits. Is, has anybody else on this podcast seen anything? Oh. Sabrina, have you seen anything at all? I, I mean, am I, are we missing something that the chief medical officer of this province has, or Stanley Brown has done that I can actually point to? I, I personally, I, I can't, yeah. and I don't think any of us have seen anything. So, I, I think again, it's a, it's a, it's a false positive, right? Like it, it doesn't exist in the minds of people, and therefore, it doesn't exist totally. So. First of all, I'm not sure how much politically this is going to hurt the government. I mean, we're, you know, June is a is an election date far off. There's a Leger poll that's out today, which shows that the government is leading Del Duca, uh, you know, um, by at least five points and that the NDP are well behind. Um, and, and so I'm not really sure that this situation causes problems for them directly and politically especially when we're going into the election season and there's going to be a lot more advertising uh, coming about. No, on the other hand, this is about a sector. This is about real people with real businesses that are going to go under. All of us on this panel and anyone who is listening knows that when the subsidies are removed, there's a lot of people coming off of life support. And I think, you know, this is one of those crucial times when they should get it right as opposed to, you know, they should be doing everything they can to get it right and get it right soon, as opposed to waiting and seeing, you know, what's going to happen. But when you begin to look at the numbers from the Restaurant Association, the estimates are that, you know, 50 percent of them are going to come back after this. Even if they are kind of staggering along right now, they aren't going to survive in the, in the year. And let's look at the names that are Mark McEwen has gone into bankruptcy protection. Lynn Crawford shut her restaurant down. Uh, so, you know, these are people who are in the industry who, you know, know how to run the show. They are staggered by this. Now, you know, there's, there's I get that there's some legal implications there and all that kind of stuff around it. But the point being um, that we are not it's not just the mom and pop shops that are that are uh, struggling here. The industry as a whole is got a huge hole in it. John. Well, the other point is that they can't find people. So, I mean, that's the other side of this. We should be opening, even if there's, you know, closer tables together or whatever, to try and help these folks, especially going into the winter season. But the reality is also the fact that if you can't find people to work in your cookery, if you can't find people to serve, if you can't find people who are going to look after your restaurant, then that's another reason why you have to close your doors. So, I mean, they're, they're getting hit in a pincer effect because they don't have the immigration 
you know, coming into this country to do those sort of things in what traditionally has been pretty bad wages and in back rooms. But more importantly, they don't have anybody in the front room who they normally have been able to depend on to keep their doors open. So let me just spin this bit back to sort of the, the, the campaign season. And I'll, uh, Sabrina and Keith, I rely on you because you guys have been paying closer attention to this. And I want to look at it from the NDP's point of view right now. Andrew Horvath has been out, I think, in, in Northern Ontario and, you know, kind of doing that tour out there during the constituency week and drumming up all kinds of support, et cetera, and trying to, you know, raise hell and maybe her polling numbers at the same time. Keith, it occurs to me that rather than standing behind the microphone and saying the government should be doing this, why is the government not doing this? Why shouldn't her posture be? Here's the problem. Here's our solution, because this is what we what she is going to have to rely on to move this thing forward, to to be the official opposition and complain about what the government hasn't done in the rearview mirror is going to wear thin in a hurry. And she's she hasn't got a lot of runway here. No, and they're actually, they are starting to, and I love this word, pivot, uh, to turn from the, the criticism of the government to outlying, you know, here's the problems, here's what we think should be done. Uh, they have some very specific ideas that they're going to put forward on that thing. But of course, we're into the, the advertising, you know, they're, 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 they've got their ads all set to go, they want to spend as much as the Tories. And their focus there is, yes, we're going to introduce Andrea, even though it's her fourth election as leader. Uh, She shouldn't really need much introduction at this point. But they're also, of course, targeting Ford. And I think, by mistake, targeting Del Duca. I'd I'd ignore that guy. No one knows who he is. I'd just ignore him. But both the PCs and the Liberals, uh, or excuse me, the NDP, have very specific ads targeting Mr. Del Duca. I find that a bit uh, strange. It's like free uh, earned, earned ads for him. It's like free gravy, right? He's getting earned media here from them by attacking him. And at least helps identify him. And it'll enable him to come out and say, no, here's who I really am. Uh, but the NDP, back to your question, Dave, uh, I just don't know what Miss Horvath can do. She's out, as you say, uh, she's raising these issues, but she's raising them in North Bay or Thunder Bay. She's traveling around uh, trying to raise support and, and not just necessarily in NDP held writings either. She's targeting some, some liberal held writings, but she's just not getting the media attention. She gets a little bit of local media attention. And I think that's always the way of an opposition leader. Uh, basically, until the writ actually starts, you know, the, the, the campaign begins She's always going to struggle for media attention, and it's going to continue to be that way, especially with Doug Ford uh, and the pandemic and just so much on the government's plate. I mean, the pandemic affects so much. I mean, education is in uproar. Uh, Healthcare, the shortage of workers there and the burnout factor, and that's a vicious cycle that's going on. There's so many issues, long-term care, autism, that this government has to deal with. And all the NDP can really do is say, you know, either they've, they've screwed this up or here's how we'd fix it. But they say it almost in a vacuum because it's very hard for them to get any attention. Well, I, with the risk of having new Democrats heads explode all over the place, uh, Sabrina, I think they could probably take a page out of Mike Harris's book. I mean, he went from being the third party. He just kept waving his common sense revolution plan around and he just kept sticking to it over and over and over again. And it was about what he would do, whether you like what he would do or not is is beside the point. But that, to me, is sort of the model of where we are in terms of successful campaigning, particularly during the pandemic, because you will all know we're languishing, that we are fatigued by what's going on. And I think we want some semblance of foundation and we want some sense of direction here, um, just and more so than ever. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there that it's, you know, Someone once told me there's no room for an opposition in a pandemic because people do want to hear from the government, the people that are making the decisions. Um, but I, I think that's changing a little bit. That I think all opposition parties have had a little difficulty getting their message out. But you know that's changing a little bit more as the PCs. I mean, we are going to hear from the premier today, but as we are, you know, generally hearing from them less and less these days. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, the Leger poll that, that John mentioned, it's, it's kind of embarrassing for the official opposition NDP because with, with those numbers, uh, they would stand like to lose that, that position. Um, and, and the liberals who are, you know, not even recognized in the house right now with, with seven seats, uh, or were elected with seven seats, uh, the minivan party as they were called jokingly at, at the time. I mean, 
that like like that I, I think that you're right that a lot of people are targeting del duca but at the same time people don't really know him as well and i, I don't know if that's if that's what's working in the liberals favor right now uh, that del duca carries a lot of political baggage uh we've seen seen the pcs are already armed with um clips to remind us you know here's when del duca announced you know a, a billion in transit for hamilton and and we all know what happened there uh with, with the numbers behind the scenes um they they all are quick to to bring up, you know, his pool and uh, overriding, you know, going out of his way to override local um, bylaws to, to get a pool in, in his backyard, that type of thing. So I, I and, you know, not to mention Kirby Go and, and the Go stations that he was called out by the Auditor General for. He has a lot of political baggage. We've already seen some of the attack ads, you know, tying him to Kathleen Wynne and some of her unpopular decisions like privatizing Hydro One. So I think the fact that People don't know Del Duca as well as they might know Horvath, who actually personally seems to poll pretty well compared to her party. And it seems to be the opposite for Del Duca, which is an, an interesting dynamic. But um, I think that, you know, it, it seems to be that, you know, Horvath, you know, reintroducing her might might end up giving them a little bit of a bump. Um, I We're hearing that there's going to be some positive ads coming from Stephen Del Duca's team. Um, and we'll see how the, the people respond to that. But I think that right uh, Right now, yeah, it's it's full on campaign mode and uh, a little less focused on on governing, I'd say. But I do think Keith is right that now the NDP is pivoting a little bit more to saying what they would do if they were elected. But that that's only a recent change. Um, I, I thought Andrea, I found her pretty weak on the subject previously. She would kind of say when we would press her on it, she would say, well, you know, it's it's not my job or it's not my place to say. But if you want to be elected, you, you got to have some answers there. Well, John, I mean, I, I think as soon as they elected um, Del Duca to be the liberal leader, uh, I, I su- su- suggested that they all they did was choose a win loser um, just because, you know, he didn't even have a seat. He lost in the last election. So the liberals put themselves behind the eight ball, which is remarkable to see how well they're doing already. But, uh, y- y- you know, the more, as Sabrina says, the more we get to know Mr. Del Duca. Yeah, I don't know how that's going to play out over the next eight months. Sure, he does have some negatives. So, <clears throat> But I, you know what? The other thing I, I wonder is that the premier has started using this line and it's coming up in other places. And that is, I'm the premier that says yes. I think it's a dangerous ad. I mean, honestly, I, and this is where I, I wonder why the NDP and the Liberals haven't pivoted more quickly. I mean, you could be, you know, it's kind of, you can hear the ad. Doug Ford says he's the yes premier. He says yes to uh, more deaths in long-term care homes. He says yes to failing our school system and making it unsafe. He says yes to failing restaurants across the prop. I mean, there you go. I just made, hey, if you listen to the podcast, there's the idea. But honestly, it's it's they don't fast pivot, do they? So I know that Del Duca and the Liberal Party don't have much money to do it anyways. But the NDP, much to Sabrina's point, I mean, they there hasn't been anything really new there. I mean, there hasn't been anything specifically wedged in to make them different. This could have been an opportunity, and I didn't see them kind of moving quickly on it. The uh, I, th- I think they were numbers from Angus Reid, and he was talking about um, the the leaders right across the country, the provincial leaders. And it would appear that Doug Ford, John, was probably the only one who didn't dip. He was up by a percentage point, and it was viewed as this kind of dangerous place for Mr. Ford to be. But he's still in the high thirties. And to your point, as you always like to make, that's probably good enough to get a majority in this province. Well, and just a quick point on that. I mean, the Angus Reid group um, and and uh, the stuff that I do is very similar but different. And, and this is where I want to contrast it. We keep the don't knows in our results. So we're showing Mr. Ford at about 42%, which is a, a good number. But they actually extract the don't knows, do the math to balance it out and come under about five points under. So the fact that he wrote actually is a good sign in the Angus Reid poll. So so no matter how you look at it, when when I did my first leader's approval rating right after the June campaign, he came in at 40%, whereas he had won the election the month before at 40.25. So if he's in the range where either ARI or us are saying, his numbers are pretty solid. 
So, Sabrina, l- let's move this forward. Um, once we is, is, is this a short term memory issue for the electorate? Is it something that we'll just decide, you know, all things being equal, we'll get through the issue around restaurants and bars. Um, we're going to give the Tories a, a thumbs up to John's point around approval ratings for the premier. And yeah, generally speaking, they handle the whole thing pretty well and we're happy with it. Yeah, I think generally um, that seems to be the mood among like average voters that I talk to. I know that we're all in our bubble uh, on Twitter and in our political circles uh, and and that kind of thing. But I think, you know, as as much, uh, you know, mistakes as the Ford government and, you know, I could say any government has made during this pandemic. I think generally speaking, for the most part, people I've talked to say that you know, the, the premier is just doing their best. People that have voted, you know, all kinds of ways previously um, from rural and ur- urban ridings. When I talk to them, they say, uh, yeah, you know, it, it could have been a lot worse. Uh, you know, they, they it was a hard time. No one really know, knew what was going on. And I think people are generally um, feeling OK right now. And and who knows what the pandemic situation will look like in around June uh, when the campaign uh, uh, comes due. But I think that the, the question for voters is going to be more about, you know, how are we doing at that point, you know, coming out of the pandemic, the recovery, um, you know, what stage of opening are we in, as opposed to, uh, you know, looking farther back to, to the Ford government's handling um, of the pandemic at the, at the height of uh, COVID, which I think that's kind of what the opposition parties will be focusing on um, in, in their attacks on, on, the, on the government. So, but if there's anything, Keith, that sort of, uh, um, I guess, sort of the the outlier here, or this thing that we might not otherwise be able to measure yet, and it kind of comes back to where we started with the restaurants. And right now, they're angry, but we saw in the federal campaign there was that that low grade anger really kind of elevated during the campaign. It was used against the the uh, federal liberals. And we saw that right across the board. It wasn't politically striped, so to speak. There was just this anger that's coming out. And I wonder whether or not what we're seeing with the restaurants and that kind of neglect around that sector, those people who have lost their jobs, have no place to go, have lost their businesses, whether that is going to be this slow boil coming that they're really going to have to pay attention to. Will they be any less angry next June right? if their restaurant is closed, if the place they worked is no longer there, if uh, all these things have collapsed because of government mismanagement or inattention to a specific sector that clearly is in need of some very direct attention? Um, I'm also a little concerned about the way the government is talking about the uh, uh, the QR codes and the Vax passports, how it's, you know, we're getting these these back signal messages. It's just a temporary program. You know, it's going to be phased out really quickly. We don't really want to do that. They're undermining it before it even gets off the ground at all. And, and, and Dr. Moore is saying, you know, well, wait a minute here. You know, you, you, you might hear next week what the plans are to ease some capacity restrictions, but he doesn't want to see anything lifted before the Christmas holidays. So I think people are expecting that, you know, like, like next week we'll hold the announcement and then, you know, the week after that, uh, boom, we're back to 100 percent capacity. I don't think that's the reality. And I think that kind of lingering disappointment, these terrible communication plans of just letting this drag out, roll out slowly, tease a little bit, but not enough to tell us what's really going on, I think will linger in people's minds. And again, if they're in a position where they haven't recovered themselves, where they've actually lost their business or lost their jobs, they're absolutely going to remember who to blame for that. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, we'll leave it there this week. Sabrina, it was great uh, of you to join us. And for those of you listening, I would certainly encourage you to check out the, uh, the Queens Park Observer. Um, Subscribe because it's, uh, it's, yeah, the the morning uh, newsletter in your inbox. If you're into this stuff, yeah, that's where you want to be. We appreciate you joining us. Thanks, Sabrina. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was so fun. John Wright is here. Keith Leslie. I'm Dave Trafford. It's On The Ledge. It's the Ontario Politics Podcast. It happens to be an eye contact podcast.